Okay, so now let's look at what kinds of life exist on Earth. And this will be a little bit more uh, fun in a sense for you because you'll get to see some organisms that you may have seen uh, out on a boat or down at the seashore. One of the things that always surprises students when they enter into an oceanography class is that the organisms that you thought you would be studying in an oceanography class aren't the ones that you get to study. Many students come into an oceanography class thinking that, well, maybe I'll get to swim with a dolphin or maybe I'll get to cut up a fish or something like that. Well, I hate to disappoint you. Oceanography is really the study of the ocean system, whereas the cutting up of the fish and the swimming with flipper, those are really the topics for a marine biology class. And in fact, it even gets worse because even a marine biology class should concentrate on the organisms that are dominant in the ocean. And it turns out that the dominant organism in the ocean looks like this. They're single-celled microbes. And hard, of, hard as it is to believe, these little cells, if we were to extract them all from the ocean and count them up and weigh them, they would have far many more numbers and they would weigh much more than the fish and squids and dolphins and all the things that we normally see. It's not really uh, without, it goes without saying that most life in the world ocean is invisible and most of the life and the dominant life and the life that is the most important in the world ocean is invisible. Think about how extraordinary that is. Most of the ocean system operates invisibly by microbes and it's that appreciation that I hope to bring to you because really it's appreciating the role of microbes not only in the world ocean but in the terrestrial biosphere as well. Microbes make our world go round. If it wasn't for microbes we'd be buried miles deep in dinosaur poo poo. So it's a good thing they're around. But sometimes students have trouble really accepting that microbes are really the important part and they're kinda hard to you know they just look like little dots. All right. As I said before, we have three different domains. Let's take a little look at the archaea, which really weren't even known until 1977 through comparative studies of ribosomal RNA and DNA. Um, one of the interesting quotes about archaea is they are as different from bacteria as we are. And what that means is that archaea even though they're single-celled, even though they look like bacteria, we don't call them bacteria anymore, even though they live in environments that we might find other bacteria in, their metabolic makeup, their DNA, their genetic machinery is completely different than bacteria. It's as different from bacteria as you and I are. Again, we find them in extreme environments, but we also find them living in the open ocean. If you were to go to a place like Yellowstone Park, you might see a hot pool like this and you'd see these colored areas. Well, these color areas, some of these are archaea. This is a kind of environment in which archaea thrive and reproduce. If you had access to a electron microscope, which few of us have access to, this is what they would look like. They don't look very impressive, even on an electron microscope. They just look like little dots, little pieces of sand, maybe. Of course, people that study these things would probably be aghast that I make such a comment. But truly, in their outer appearance, they really aren't notable in any way. What they're more notable for is the fact that they can survive in pure salt or survive in a very high methane environment. Bacteria are, as I've implied before, are really an important group of organisms, an important domain of organisms on life. They're the most diverse. We find them everywhere. You have them in your mouth. You have them on your hands. You find them on table surfaces. You find them living on rocks. We find them at the beach. We find them at the deepest trenches. Bacteria are really everywhere. In fact, when bacteria first evolved somewhere around 3 to 3.5 billion years ago, they pretty much had the Earth to themselves for a couple billion years until eukaryotes came along. We call that the age of bacteria. And it was during that age of bacteria that all of Earth's biochemical cycles were, biogeochemical cycles, were established. The carbon cycle, 
the silica cycle, the nitrogen cycle. Bacteria are what's known as nature's little recyclers. And in doing so, they keep life going because they make material that's once put into complicated form, organic matter, they break that stuff down so that organisms can use it again. So the bacteria perform a really important role and when they establish themselves on life on establish themselves on earth they really establish the foundations for all life on earth whether we realize it or not or whether we appreciate it or not our lives really depend on the fact that bacteria are here and one final note when we talk about climate change or any other human impacts uh, affecting the habitability of the planet or when we talk about it ruining the planet what we're really talking about is ruining human uh, existence on the planet. No matter what we do, we're really not going to destroy planet Earth. We don't yet have a Death Star like you saw in Star Wars, and we're really not capable of completely obliterating all life on this planet. We just haven't figured out how to do that yet, but I imagine we probably could if we wanted to. So when we talk about human impacts on Earth, remember we're talking about the ability of humans to survive on Earth. And I would imagine, if bacteria can imagine it all, or if they ever have a thought, they would do just fine without us and probably be just as happy if humans weren't on our planet. That's my little pitch for bacteria. Bacteria have a cell structure that's called prokaryotic. That means your DNA is not surrounded by a membrane. Our DNA is surrounded in a nucleus. It means they lack internal organelles, but we do know they are highly sophisticated metabolically. Bacteria, as it says here, can be found everywhere. So they're sophisticated in that they can use many different substances and break down many different substances, but they don't have a cell structure that's organized in the same way as multicellular life and some forms of eukaryotic single cell life. Their numbers in the ocean are staggering. In one milliliter, that's a very tiny amount, a cubic centimeter, we find 300,000 cells of SAR-11. On average, we found about a million bacteria in a drop of seawater. Now think about that. When you go down to the beach and swallow seawater, you're swallowing millions of bacteria at the same time. Extraordinary. The prokaryotic cell structure looks something like this. I have a cell wall. Again, this is a cell wall that's uh, made up of a particular type of uh, biochemistry that's, again, different from our cell walls. And they have DNA and, R and RNA and these kinds of things, but they're not organized in a nucleus. This is a prokaryotic cell structure. And again, this is what they look like. If we look at if we stain bacteria and we can attach a fluorescent dye to their uh, cell wall and put them in a microscope that makes them light up, this is what they look like. It kind of looks like the stars at night or in one of those Hubble photographs that you might see, the Hubble's telescope photographs. But in fact, this is a liter of seawater. Just think about a liter uh, pop bottle. And in this particular sample were found 20,000 different kinds of bacteria. That should give you some idea of the extraordinary diversity of bacteria in the ocean. Take a one liter pop bottle and think about it. 20,000 different, not individuals, but species. Different kinds of organisms. Imagine. Bacteria also can form chains. And this is a particular type of chain forming bacteria. A filamentous cyanobacteria. And we find these types of filamentous cyanobacteria in lakes and ponds, but we also find them out in the middle of the ocean. And one of the things that these filamentous cyanobacteria do that's interesting is that they fix atmospheric nitrogen. That means they can absorb atmospheric nitrogen and make use of us. For humans to absorb atmospheric nitrogen and put it into, we commonly put it into fertilizers, takes an enormous amount of energy. These organisms can do it really very efficiently and if we could learn how to do it as efficiently as they did well then we'd have agricultural crops forever uh, if we could figure out how they do it but here we see again filamentous cyanobacteria a type of bacterium that's found in the ocean